I've handed out some suggestions for further reading. They're purely personal suggestions, sort of desert island discs on the Celtic Church. The library has actually a copy of the first edition of my Rise of Western Christendom. In the habit of professors, I've changed my mind and rewritten a bit of it, including the Irish bit in uh, the second edition. One doesn't often get the chance to commit esprit d'escalier, and I did. I'm terribly sorry. The following story was still being told in County Mayo in the 1930s at the foot of Crow Patrick, the holy mountain associated with Patrick, to whose top, and it is a very penitential hall, an annual pilgrimage still takes place up to this day. In Patrick's time, goes the story, a pagan named Cromdhuv, Crom the Black, lived near Cropatrick. He and Patrick were friends, but he did not wish to become a Christian. Three times he sent his boy with a gift of a quarter of beef to Patrick. And each time Patrick said, Deo gratias, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. This puzzled Crom Doob greatly when his boy reported it, and finally it enraged him. For in Dark Age Ireland there was no such thing as a free lunch. A gift demanded a counter-gift. Not to respond to the gift or to give such a paltry return was an affront to the giver. So Crom Doob summoned Patrick to his house. Patrick assured him that he had not insulted him. He had offered the counter gift of prayer. To prove it, he asked to have the three quarters of beef put on one side of the scales, and on the other he put Deo gratias, thanks be to God, written three times on a piece of paper. <laughs> the piece of paper, of course, far way down the heavy sides of beef, and that was why Crom Doop and his people accepted the Christian faith. <laughs> this story goes back without interruption to the first life of Patrick written in around 675 AD. It is a quintessentially Irish view of the problem as presented to the average person by the arrival of Christianity. Note that it's termed posed in terms of the gift exchange on which Celtic society functioned. Every gift must have a counter-gift. In such a world, nothing was for nothing. Yet here in their midst was a new institution, the Christian church with its clergy and its monasteries, like Cromdouve, they were prepared to give generously to it. Those herds of sheep and cattle which end up on the great vellum pages of the Holy Scriptures, and I brought the Book of Kells once again for you to admire. Land, renders of food for the churches and monasteries, even their own sons and daughters donated to Christ as monks and clergymen. And what did the church offer in return for all this tangible, heavy wealth? Nothing. Hope of a heaven that no one had seen, protection of a high king of whom no one had heard, mere words of blessing, empty air compared with solid sides of beef, and words not even in language which one, which one understood. It was enough to puzzle any decent Irishman. This was the dilemma which faced the Celtic Church in the 7th and 8th centuries. What did it have to offer the laity? What made this worse, of course, to our modern eyes at least, was that the spiritual powerhouses of the Celtic world were its monasteries. As my talk on the life of Columba and the monastery at Iona made plain, 
these monasteries were very deliberately thought of as lying to one side of normal Irish society. They belonged to the desert, not to the settled world. Often, as in Iona and as Lindisfarne in northern England, they were washed all around by the wide salt desert of the sea. They were holy islands. What happened on them seemed an almost utopian reversal of the normal laws of normal human life. Here were men and women without kin or children, just beside a world where the kin group and the family counted for everything. Here were knives that would not draw blood, beside a world run by warfare and the blood feud. Here were humans and animals reconciled in the midst of a world used to very savage hunting, and always the noise of a non-language, the eerie Latin chant and the recitation of alien books, a lasting low-voiced congregation, high knowledge feeds me, the melodious Latin song of the believers. How could a religion whose most spectacular representatives seemed almost as encapsulated from normal society as the inhabitants of a modern space station reach out to the world around them? Well, now, part of the answer is commonsensical. We should not take the self-image of the few monasteries too much at their face value. For here's one bit of good news. On one matter at least, the Irish of the 7th century were Episcopalians. They had lots of bishops. <laughs> the problem was they had too many of them. Each little tribe, and don't forget there are at least 150 of these, had its own bishop and its own clergy. And these were basically small men who followed all too faithfully the fate of their own tribe as it slithered up and down the bloody league table of Irish intertribal warfare. Indeed, one might say the Irish were true Episcopalians. They had bishops, but they did not expect too much of bishops. <laughs> They assumed that many were flaky and that not a few were corrupt. <laughs> it was therefore the great monasteries which emerged as it were as the flagships of Christianity, precisely because they stood a little to one side of Irish society and because they ministered therefore to whole confederations of tribes. It was precisely in fact their fierce otherworldliness which gave them a purchase on the real world of Irish society. They were pan-tribal institutions. Many of the greatest monasteries stood in places such as Iona and Armagh, where many tribes met. They often stood beside great prehistoric sanctuaries, which had played the same role as intertribal joining points in pagan times. The great monasteries, as it were, set the tone of Celtic Christianity, but there were a remarkable number of ordinary bishops and clergy around to pick up the message and transmit it. What was that message? Well, part of it was not at all a modern message. It was a medieval message. It was, quite frankly that a society benefited most from those who differed most from that society. Only persons who lived a special life, specially dedicated to the service of Christ, could pray effectively for all others. It was as powerhouses of prayer on behalf of others, of intercessory prayer, that the monks and the clergy reached out to cast a fine, invisible, but very tough net over the entire reach of the Celtic world. It was the business of monks and clergy 
to chant on behalf of others and in a language which others did not understand any more than they would understand the average person was expected to understand the magic of twisted gold of the Aesdana, the intricate knowledge of tribal law stored in the heads of the Brithaman, of the law speakers, or the high art of the Phillies, of the poets. They were the ones entrusted with the song for the absent ones, potion prayer for the living and for the dead. The demand for prayer on their behalf and not preaching, not preaching, was what drew the laity of Ireland into the churches and up to the walls of the monasteries. And there they received a gracious welcome. The monks had no doubt that they were on the whole a pretty rough lot. Warriors, cattle rustlers, wild, drunken poets, many of them unreconstructed polygamists. As we saw last time, they understood from their own experience the fierce world of the Old Testament and not quite the gentle world of the Gospels. But there was room for them in the church. The monks and clergy express this situation in very traditional terms, and I recommend looking at these diagrams. They had always tended to divide their landscape in the Celtic world into concentric circles. Uh, the diagram halfway down the page. At the centre was the home, Around it was grouped the comforting presence of fully domesticated animals extending from the dog, who might even enter the house, to the cow, the domesticated pig. But beyond them, in the world of the boglands and the mountains and the woods, there lurked always the grim antithesis to well-organized existence. Along those margins lurked the glass, the grey dog, the wolf thought of by the Irish not as a separate species, but simply as god dogs gone wild. Wolves, therefore, were terrible reminders of what could happen even to human beings once they had cast off the restraints of the settled land. It was a moral map of the Irish landscape which charted out with sober precision the extent to which humans and animals alike could run wild. And monasteries arranged their sacred spaces in a manner that echoed this ancient pre-Christian mapping of the landscape according to moral criteria. Only monks, it was believed, could really enter the monastic church itself. That was for holy persons. But in the great courtyard outside the monastic church, there was room, as indeed there was room in the farmyard outside the farmer's home for cows, hens, pigs and dogs, for at least the more domesticated species of lay person. <laughs> we let enter there the crowds of local people who are not given to much villainy. Given the sort of villainy my compatriots could get up to in the 7th century, one could be assured that they were not necessarily the majority of the population. <laughs> Their piety was very much highlighted by very real options. An unchurched warrior society, still bloodthirsty, violent, the home of wolves, exiles, outlaws, thugs. But what enabled this bonding between the lawful Christians and their spiritual guides to actually take place? It was, quite frankly, we return to the distinctive native notion of the gift and the counter-gift. What the Christian Church offered was presented, quite frankly, as a gift in return for a gift. The laity supported the clergy and the monasteries in various ways by offering their wealth and services. In return, the local church or monastery was expected to offer the counter-gift 
of Christian blessing. Baptism, the reading, that is the solemn reading of the Psalms and the Gospels, in church services on regular occasions for which a great book like the Book of Kells would have been brought out to show that this is the gift of the clergy to the laity. The reading, confession, penance, absolution, and at the end of the life, prayers for the dead and for the favoured few, burial near the church or in the cemetery where the monks awaited their resurrection in the last day. The Irish are also responsible for the notion of a cemetery as particular holy ground. They'd always call it the resurrection, the place of resurrection, and nowadays the great high crosses which we admire so much are always scattered in these cemetery areas. They are the high crosses of kings, great bishops, great lords of the land. And it was by this punctilious exchange of gifts between the laity, the people of the local tribe, and the church, that the sewing together, the sewing together, as they said, of church and people took place on a local level all over Ireland and the Celtic world. Now, what gift was better than the gift of forgiveness? It's from this angle, I think, that we should approach an aspect of Celtic Christianity which marked a significant break with the practice of earlier Roman Christians and the true beginning of the Middle Ages. A new insistence on regular confession, penance, absolution. In offering spiritual counsel and absolution, to lay persons who approach them, the monks simply allowed to flow over from inside their monasteries practices which had been in existence for hundreds of years in the great monasteries of Egypt and of the Middle East. What matters, though, is that in Wales, Ireland, and southern Scotland, in the 6th and 7th centuries, a practice which had developed intensely among monks and for monks over, now became available for the first time to everyone. It happened in very much the same way as the art of writing first developed and first and foremost within the monasteries of the Celtic world so as to copy the Holy Scriptures, rapidly taken up outside by guardians of native tradition, lawyers, and poets. And here we must remember one very important thing. We don't know if the Celtic Church has had any relations with the real Egypt. On that issue, the jury is out, and I don't think they did, quite frankly, because I think the truth is often is more interesting they thought of themselves, as it were, as avatars of the monks of Egypt. They turned themselves into, as it were, virtual copts. They had none of our sense that the monks of Egypt had lived centuries before them and thousands of miles away in a very different land, for they had before them the written text of the lives and sayings of the Desert Fathers, as these had been transcribed into Latin many centuries before, in their own cells, lovingly copied. They were not professors of history. They had a great advantage that these stories and sayings were not historical documents to them, telling of a distant time and a distant place, they were considered the condensed essence of an eternal Christian wisdom. They told just the truth about the battle of the soul. It was their business to make this timeless wisdom blossom in their own days and in their own land. And blossom it did. 
what they picked up first and foremost from the world of the Desert Fathers was the total dedication of the monk to Christ. One of the most beautiful distillations of the originally Egyptian monastic ideal of rapt contemplation of God has come down to us in the form of an Irish hymn which we now sing in the hymnal as hymn 488. Rop tu moi baile. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Nought be all else to thee save that thou art. Be my best thought nigh day and the night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. But of course, it's only when one tries to dedicate one's whole self to Christ that one becomes aware of how little of that self wishes to follow. <laughs> Poignant Irish poems speak of the monk's temptations, of his ever-wandering thoughts. How my thoughts betray me, how they flit and stray. Well may they appall me on great judgment day. Through the psalms they wander roads that are not right, grunging, shouting, squabbling in God's very sight. No sharp sword affrights them, nor any threatening whip. Like an eel's tail, greasy, from my grasp they slip. Christ, the chaste, the cherished, searcher of the soul, grant the sevenfold spirit, keep them in control. Grant me, Christ, to reach you, with you let me be. You are not fail or fickle, nor feeble will like me. After being brought face to face with so much frailty, then what can one do? The answer of the Desert Fathers had been extremely simple. Go to a wise old man. Go to an um, apa, from which our word abbot, of course, comes. Go to a spiritual father, a wise Appa, and tell him all about it, and he will counsel you. Like a skilled doctor, he will give you remedies in the form of ascetic practices judged most appropriate for the healing of one's particular besetting sins. But above all, he will pray for you to God, begging God on your behalf for forgiveness and amendment. The monks of Wales, Ireland and Scotland offer nothing less. No serious Christian, in their opinion, could do without the counsel and the prayers of others. Each must seek out a soul friend, an ankara. A monk without such a soul friend was quite frankly, as an Irish phrase put it, like a body without a head. For only through turning to others, through humble dependence on their prayers, would the supreme gift of repentance come, and with it the dearly wished for gift of penitent tears. Tuk dam o de moir. Grant me, gracious God, to allay my fears while I walk this world wave after wave of tears. For your goodness sake, for your kingly state, grant me a well of tears, ere it be too late. Let my heart drip tears as your heart dripped blood. Who can give me tears? Only you, my God. Developed by monks for monks and written in Irish, this is some of the most gripping religious poetry ever written. But what matters is that due to the silent pressure of the laity, due to that sewing together of church and tribe, piety became available beyond the walls of the monastery to an extent which had not occurred in other parts of Western Europe. The counter gift of the church to its laity was the monastic gift of spiritual counselling, penance, absolution on a regular basis. 
lay persons, men and women alike, could seek out from among the monks and clergy their own soul frame, their own amjkhara, who in exchange for the gift of their confession would give the invisible, inestimable gift of comfort, counsel and forgiveness. As a result, an inner ring, as it were, was formed around the church among a more nominally Christian population, an inner ring formed of persons who took their own self-amendment seriously. They came to be known as the Ais Ethrige, the people of penance, the repentant folk. They expected to go regularly to confession, to tell their sins, to receive the remedy of measured penance, to enjoy the privilege of spiritual counsel and absolution, which had long been essential but only among the monks. Not everybody did this. In the 7th century, there was no such thing as compulsory regular confession as would develop later centuries in the medieval Catholic Church. This only happened after almost six centuries later in 1215. But at the time, the turning to the laity was a novel move, even if it only affected pious members of the people of repentance. Spectacular representatives of the otherworldly spirituality of the Desert Fathers, the great monks of Ireland had no hesitation whatsoever in bringing the rather sheltered wisdom of the Desert Fathers down to earth among the average people in their own tribe. And of course, once you look for it, there's always a lot to forgive. Indeed, it's rather a pity for the reputation of the Celtic churches that the monks, who were zealous men of the pen, wrote it all down. The Celtic penitentials, which began to be put together around 650, 660, are relentlessly circumstantial documents. There's hardly a sin in the book, from homicide by an archbishop <laughs> to masturbation by teenagers, which is not noted and whose penance is not measured out with due care. They cover a surreal range of situations, some are sober and acute judgments on real sins. One, this is from um, a Welsh and Cornish book of penance, one who constrains another to get drunk for the sake of good fellowship, writes the Welsh fathers, shall do the same penance as the drunken man. But one who under the influence of hatred or wantonness constrains others to drunkenness, that he may basely put them to confusion or ridicule, shall do penance as a slayer of souls. Others seem to address no more than totally trivial breaches of hygiene or even of good manners. He who gives to anyone liquor in which a mouse or a weasel is found dead <laughs> shall do penance with three fasts. But if those little beasts are found in the flour or in any dry food or in porridge or in curdled milk, whatever is around their body shall be cast out and all the rest taken in good faith. <laughs> now, not every scholar enjoys reading the Celtic penitentials. <laughs> These are not euphoric New Age documents. They tell it like it is. Our Victorian forebears were appalled by them in the words of the Reverend Dr. Charles Plummer, a learned editor of so many of the documents of the Celtic Church, the penitential literature, he writes, is in truth a deplorable feature of the medieval church. Evil deeds, the imagine of which may perhaps have floated through the mind in our darkest moments, are here tabulated and reduced to system. It is hard to see how anyone could busy himself with such literature without being the worse for it. <laughs> now, the first answer to this studiously shocked reaction is provided, was provided for me by a Dutch cab driver who once turned to me on the way to Schiphol Airport when caught in a monstrous traffic jam which threatened to make me lose my plane. With evident pride in his command of colloquial English, he turned to me and said, Well, mean hair, shit happens. 
In Ireland, as elsewhere, sin happened. The issue is what to do about it. And here we must never allow ourselves to forget the basic, insistent message of the penitential. Forgiveness happens. There is no illness for which God has not given a remedy. There's no sin for which there is not forgiveness. By modern standards, it may be tough love, but it's very real love. And when we can glimpse the Celtic penitential system actually at work, it's not nearly as terrible as we might think. It was simply a system which paid the laity the compliment of treating those of them who drew near to the church as the A.S. Arthrige, as the people of penance, as Christians quite as capable of moral and religious progress as were any monks. They were grown-ups and should be treated as grown-ups. Spiritual progress in the Christian life was always needed. The advice of experienced spiritual guides, the prayers of others were always available. And God's forgiveness could be expected to reach out to touch every detail, every life, every sin in what was a rough and violent society. It was a system which believed implicitly in happy endings. So let me end with a happy ending, which shows the system actually at work in a singularly down-to-earth manner. It concerns none other than the austere Columba, Columcille, in around 580 AD. By 580, Columba had been at the island of Iona for 15 years. There, as we saw, he'd established a monastery as a holy island, ringed by the salt sea. It was an almost utopian world outside the world. Yet, as we read the story of his life, we realize that it consists largely of incidents in which his prayers on behalf of others <coughs> were involved. And these others were not only monks. Columbus' prayers embraced a surprisingly wide range of people, warlords, exiles, brigands, penitents bearing sins of every kind. He prayed hard for them all. Despite his notional isolation in the desert of the sea, all sorts of persons with all sorts of problems, in fact, came across the narrow straits between Iona and Argyle to consult him on a regular basis. One such was um, Lugne, the ferryman of the neighbouring island of Rathlin. At another time, a certain layman, Lugne, came to him and complained regarding his wife, whom, as he said, had an aversion to him, would not allow him to enter into marital relations with her, for he was a very ugly man. <laughs> and so the couple settled down to a counselling session, Irish style. In short, the wife agreed to fast on the same day, the husband also with the saint. And on the next night following, the saint prayed for them. Next day, the wife approached Columba. His counsel, his prayers had rescued the situation. For the husband that I hated yesterday, I loved today. For during the night, I know not how, my heart was changed within me from loathing into love. So much... For that, writes the biographer, plainly less shocked by these intimate details of the marriage bed than was the Reverend Dr. Plummer. So much for that. From that day until the day of her death, that wife's affections were indissolubly set in love for her husband. <laughs> Both for the leaders of the Celtic Church and for their very humblest clients, the hand of God was believed to reach out from a distant heaven much as the hands of great abbots such as Columba appeared to be able to reach out to the furthest corners of Ireland from monasteries thought of as perched on the edge of the world so as to touch all manner of people, reached out to touch all his creatures, to bring them healing, to bring them forgiveness to the most intimate sins, the resolution of the most desperate or the most banal situations, even at times to heal the sad gulf between the human and the animal world. One remembers the great white horse who nuzzled up to the bosom of the dying Columba. 
It is the belief of a church at the edge of the world in the power of Christ its God. This God was very much the high king of heaven. His power extended to all earthly matters, even to the most humble. His forgiveness reached down to every sin, even to the most shameful, trivial, or horrendous. It is this belief in the power of Christ which makes the Celtic Church, born in a violent world so many centuries ago, still speak to us. We should be grateful that it happened and that we can still benefit each in our own way from its example. Thank you for your patience.